There's another line of objection, which actually challenges Descartes about whether we can know for certain that uh, the cogito exists. So Descartes says, I know for certain that I exist as a thinking thing. But some questions that we can ask about that are, do you know for certain that you are the same you that you were five minutes ago? Do you know for certain that each of these thoughts that you're having are connected with other thoughts, the other thoughts that you seem to be having, in such a way that they're all the same person, that they're all the same substance or the same thing? It seems to you like you're having a continuous experience, but how do you know for sure that you that what you call you isn't actually just like a kind of um, shuffling through multiple consciousnesses so that you've been another consciousness of another person two minutes ago and two minutes from now you'll be the consciousness of yet another person. How do you know that there actually is a continuity between these consciousnesses that means that you are the same person? Now one possible reply to this objection that Descartes can make is Descartes can say um, I know it because that's all I mean by saying that I exist. I, 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 maybe I don't know that there aren't multiple, say, bodies or brains attached to this experience, but insofar as I'm having an experience right now, uh, I can't be wrong about the experience and the I of the experience existing. Another way to put it is that with every experience, there's also a subject of experience. With every experience, there's also an experiencer. There's no such thing as experience independent of an I that experiences. That doesn't mean that the I exists for any more than that one second, that one moment of experience. We don't know that for sure, and Descartes can, can, can concede that, but he does know for sure, this reply would go, that that he exists in that moment of doubting, of questioning, and so on. And that's all he needs to, to make the rest of his argument work. There are a num number of objections to the argument for the existence of God. Probably the most um, obvious one, or the most well-known one, is the one that says there's a problem with the transition from the claim that I have an idea of God as a all uh, perfect thing to the conclusion that um, I that that perfect thing has to that a perfect thing corresponding to my idea has to exist. Um, it's not um, it's not adequate to conclude the existence of a real thing just on the basis of an idea this is basically the strategy of argument here. So all we have in terms of um, what we know about the about what God is like, the attributes of God, according to Descartes' argument, all we know about the attributes of God in the premises are just attributes of my idea of God. And when we try to conclude from that to a claim about a real existent thing, um, we uh, we end up concluding more than can actually be supported by our premises. Now, in order to get into the details, this, this is a, a description of a very broad strategy of objection to Descartes' argument. I haven't really talked about the details, like for instance, his principle that, um, that there must be at least as much power in the cause as in the effect. But one way to kind of bring this strategy to bear on that part of Descartes' argument is to say, what do you mean when you say power? I mean, how much power is there in the effect of my idea of God? Only as much power as there is in any idea. It can't be any more power than there is in an idea. And how much power does there need to be in a cause in order to produce an idea? I mean, ideas can be produced by all kinds of things. I mean, maybe my idea of God is produced by like indigestion, the f like food that I eat, right? So I don't, I don't know, I mean, it doesn't, an idea is a relatively thin and powerless thing. And my idea of God in terms of its actual existence is just a thin and powerless thing, um, relatively powerless thing like any other idea. So it doesn't take that much real power necessarily to produce it. Uh, I'm improvising a little bit. I'm trying to kind of share some of the strategy of the way that one would object along these lines. There are other objections that can be given to the argument for the existence of God as well, but I want to share one of them. I'm broadly inspired by Aquinas's objection to the what's sometimes called the ontological argument, which he presents in his um, 
text on the existence of God that we read for class. Another objection to Descartes' argument, which is one of the most famous, is called the Cartesian circle. Um, so the Cartesian circle is, it is basically this, and th this was pointed out by some of the earliest objectors to Descartes, the people who wrote the objections that Descartes then replied to. Um, it goes like this. <clears throat> if you look at how Descartes aims to reconstruct his beliefs, the first thing he says he knows for sure is the cogito. And from there, he claims to discover that God must exist. Okay, he examines his ideas and he goes through an argument, an argument for the existence of God. And then once he believes that God exists, he says, uh, this good God, then he can trust his clear and distinct ideas. That is basically his reasoning. But how does he, um, what reasons does he have to trust his reasoning when he's arguing for the existence of God, right? He needs to be able to trust his reasoning, his clear and distinct ideas, before he argues for the existence of God. Otherwise, the argument itself could just all be stuff that's pumped into his mind by an evil deceiver. Um, if he doesn't yet know that a good God exists, he doesn't yet have enough reason to trust his clear and distinct ideas based on his conclusions at the end of Meditation 1. So how can he use clear and distinct ideas to convince himself that there's a God without that being circular? Okay. Again, the problem, I'm saying it the same way over and over again, but the problem is Descartes, by arguing for the existence of God, by sort of starting from the cogito and then arguing for the existence of God, Descartes seems to be presuming that he can trust his clear and distinct ideas before he has the key premise that justifies his trust in his clear and distinct ideas. That is, he's, he's claiming to be able to trust his clear and distinct ideas before he's actually established the foundation. He's relying on trust in his clear and distinct ideas to argue for the existence of God, and it's only God that provides a justification for his clear and distinct ideas. So he's arguing in a circle, or he's, as it's sometimes called, begging the question. He's assuming the thing that he needs God in order to prove, or he needs the, um, he needs the reliability of the belief in God in order to be able to prove. And then finally, there are objections to Descartes' argument that the mind and body are distinct. Remember, there's the famous one paragraph from Meditation 6 where he says, by the fact that I can clearly and distinctly perceive my mind as a thinking thing independent of my body, that I can think of it just on its own without my body, I see clearly that its essence is to be a thinking thing, that the essence of my mind is to be a thinking thing and not a body. And that proves to me that my mind can exist apart from my body, because if it if it's if it's itself its own substance, fully um, defined and uh, having us having this nature of being a, a thinking thing and and solely a thinking thing, then that means that it could exist as a solely thinking thing without any physical things attached to it. And the objection to this is that. The fact that something only appears to us a certain way, or that we're able to think of a, of one thing independent of another thing, um, does not provide any evidence that the thing that we can think independently of the other thing can actually exist independently of the other thing. So you could imagine, for instance, um, living things that are not water-based, that are not based on water, aren't composed of water in any way. You imagine kinds of alien creatures, for instance, they're based on, you know, their bodies are, are made of silicone or made of something other than water. You can imagine it, but that doesn't mean that it's actually possible. It's still an open scientific question, open question in science, whether there is any life in the universe apart from on Earth, uh, all of the life on Earth is water-based. And so it's a completely open question whether there even can be life anywhere that's not based on water. So the fact that you can imagine a living thing that's not based on water does not prove that living things could be based on something other than water. And there are a lot of other cases like that. Um, the, the point, again, of the objection is that Descartes thinks that the fact that he can conceive of the mind apart from the body is enough to show him 
that the mind is uh, is separable from the body. And that's not a uh, that that bit of evidence that it's conceivable apart from the body is not enough to prove that it really can be separated from the body necessarily. I'm not saying that it can't be. I'm just saying the argument isn't um, the argument has this flaw according to the objection.